Welcome to this edition of What's the Score? Let me remind you, if you enjoyed today's podcast, please click the like button wherever you listen to this program. And if you'd like to support this and future programs, I encourage you to become a patron via patreon.com. There'll be details to follow in the middle of the program. We couldn't do the program without our patrons, so thank you. And enjoy today's wonderful podcast. Today's program made possible by patrons like you. Welcome to where we celebrate music from the movies. From the golden age to present day, we've got it all covered. We talk to those in the entertainment industry and find out about their favorite scores. You found the podcast, What's the Score? I'm your host, Frank R. Wilson. So sit back, relax, grab a popcorn, and let's see what we'll be hearing today. Recognize that music? It's a favorite of our guest today. Now, he's been recognized as a top James Bond expert in the world, uh, evidenced by his appearance in shows on channels like Discovery, VH1, TLC, and actually recently Vice, where he was featured in a four-part documentary on the Bond films. He's produced numerous fan conventions. He's visited over 500 Bond locations on five continents. And... He takes fans on tours to those locations, one of which I was a part of. Uh, But his love of film music goes beyond James Bond, as you'll find out today. So I hope all of you will please join me in welcoming Matt Sherman to the program. Hi, Matt. Hello, Frank. I'm delighted to be here. Thank you for such a lovely introduction. Oh, my pleasure. Exactly as you wrote it, right? (laughs) (laughs) I'm just kidding. I'm just kidding. I'm just kidding. He's... He's a he's an amazing man who's a, got a, a. You'll find out today as we as we talk just uh, how much he's contributed to the Bond community, and and I also want to apologize to our audience today. I'm kind of suffering from a little bit of a sore throat and a cough, so bear with me if I uh, don't sound quite right or if I have to pause for a moment. So I just want to put that out there. Anyway, uh, again, I'm I'm glad to have you have you with us today, Matt. Um, as most of my listeners know, I always like to find out more about the person buying the microphone and learn more about them. So I was just wondering if you could tell us a little bit about yourself and, uh, you know, growing up and family and the formative years, so to speak, and just kind of give us a little bit of background about you. Well, thanks very much. And again, thank you for joining us as a featured tour guest in New Orleans recently. You, you welcomed us so greatly to the city, made everyone feel good about their experience and shared so much of your knowledge base. I, I grew up in New York City and environs and suburbs of Burbs, and I spent some time and sometimes my in the city and the, and the suburbs. And because of that, it wasn't that infrequent to encounter a celebrity. Um, I might be in an elevator at the Plaza Hotel and see somebody from Barney Miller, one of the cops from Barney Miller, detectives. Or I might be riding an elevator to the Empire State Building's top and uh, John Lithgow's in the elevator. And so, yeah, and and I had family who lived, my mom was living in uh, Upper West Side and a lot of actors and others uh, made their home there and you'd see them pretty frequently. It became almost a game. When Janine Sherman and I returned to the city, and for visiting for a week, we play that game and see how many people will spot. We always spot different ones in different fields of entertainment. So uh, I grew up enjoying film locations. I grew up enjoying uh, what you're doing with What's the Score, which I appreciate. It's both for audio files and film buffs and, and brings it together. And I grew up in, in this super center of entertainment and fashion and all this wonderful stuff. And... Um, 
even in school. I had some school chums who became uh, actors, famous actors, and ones who had gone to my high school and, and were, were prominent in entertainment. So it's just kind of always been my blood. I do have some family who were in show business in various forms, either in production or in performance. So it was kind of exciting to grow up that way. And it was kind of natural, I guess, for me to latch on to James Bond as a franchise that way because I grew up as a Bond fan. So, so I mean, would it be safe to say that it was... It was in your DNA, I guess, for lack of a better way of saying it. <laughs> it's in my DNA to want to go to the latest movie. And then growing up in New York, you're going to see the movie before the rest of the United States in most cases. Right. So, you know, I have fond memories of waiting online for several hours to buy a ticket to Return of the Jedi. And then several more hours to see the film Return of the Jedi. Yeah. And less fond memories of my school chums giving me spoilers for the film. Hey, by the way... Uh, Darth Vader really is Luke's father. We wanted to kill them after waiting online for four hours. <laughs> <laughs> oh my! So I mean, uh, so I take it then that your your family ended up being supportive of your uh, passions and of the things that you were interested in. Uh, you, you you weren't set as you know. Come on, you know. Come on. What about baseball or basketball? You know, they were supportive. I take it. I love that question. No one's ever asked me that question before. I've never thought about it before. But my family was supportive. They took me to see a Bond film, and then two years later, I dragged them to see a Bond film. Hey, I have to see the new Bond film. <laughs> uh, and they were supportive of me reading Ian Fleming at age nine, you know, which is pretty adult material in some ways. So my family was encouraging creative pursuits, and they were very kind. And my mom didn't throw out all my comic books and all my collectibles, uh, but that's another story. Now, see, now, you were lucky. I grew up in a military family, so we would move every two or three years. And, and every two or three years, we always had to go through our stuff and find out, okay, we're not going to move all this. we got to throw some stuff away. I mean, I had to throw away my road race set. You know what I'm talking about. Mm -hmm. uh, the, the, the attache case. I mean, I, I had all kinds of goodies that, that you know, are long gone now. And, you know, and I, don't, I don't blame my parents. I know they... They didn't. They didn't see the significance of it, but you know, we had to dump all that stuff because we were moving. And we didn't. We didn't have room for everything, and so that's great that they were supportive of uh, what your interest and your passion was. Definitely, the two items you mentioned—the Sears Road Race set and the the other item, the old attaché case variants—these are worth thousands of dollars each today. Some of them. Oh, I know. And, I know. And it's incredible. And but what I did was I I I moved to Florida. And some of my things, most of my things were in storage. And I felt like I was in the military. I moved to Florida with like a few pair of underwear and that's about <laughs> it. And they were destroying the flood, a lot of my collectibles. And I realized that they don't have permanence in my life. And so I became more flexible. And as a collector, I became someone who buys and sells. And, and so everything in my house that's James Bond has been moved around. And, and so I have pictures of the room through the years where you're like, where's all those collectibles? They're gone. <laughs> well, you know, and and, and 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 I'll leave names out of it. But you and I have a mutual friend, and I remember asking him once because uh, he was going to sell his his James Bond collection, and I said, well, "It looks like you're going to do pretty good." I mean, it. I never would have thought some of this stuff would be worth so much money. And he said, "Well, instead of investing in stocks, I invested in bonds." <laughs> I mean, you know, that was that was a very clever answer, and it's very true. It's amazing. Absolutely amazing the value that some of this stuff has, and of course we just had a recent uh, auction. Someone that I'm sure you know who was selling his collection, and it was just amazing the amount of money that he was getting for some of that stuff. So, anyway, let's let's get into music. Let's get into the film music that you chose. And since we've been talking about James Bond, let's start with a, a cue from a James Bond film. Probably, in many people's opinion. Certainly amongst the top two, maybe top three uh, scores that John Barry did for uh, for James Bond. I'm talking about the film Diamonds Are Forever. And the cue, uh, cue, one of the cues that you wanted to highlight was called uh, Mr. Went and Mr. Kid. Tell us a little bit about that cue and why you wanted to include that amongst your favorites. Yeah, I'll try to keep it concise. I could tell you a lot about that cue and that soundtrack. There's so much that goes into it. You and I know John Barry as the greatest maestro. 100 film scores in 40 years. Right. And Diamonds Are Forever is a perfect storm. Why, Frank? Because his mother's a classical pianist. 
His father is a projectionist. He's going to films all the time. That's in his DNA. And he has a love of jazz. And here he's bringing these. That soundtrack is that the Goldfinger LP had eclipsed even the Beatles albums and sales at one yeah. point. And the producers come, the producers on the music end come to John Barry and they say, add more cues, add more source cues. So now John is composing three and four minute pieces for songs that get excerpted in the film as brief snatches. So it's a very rich album in many ways. And it's an incredible journey and it's also a part of our life. When I go to all these locations and that biography, I apologize, is outdated. I was auditing recently and I go, Holy mackerel, I've been to a thousand James Bond film and book Have locations. Really? Wow. Yes, plus things from two dozen other franchises like Casino or uh, Brady Bunch or the new interview with a vampire, love of locations. Huh. But, but when you're traveling and you're taking a busload of fans between locations for an hour because they're not always co located in the movie, you listen to soundtracks and, and we'll play trivia, you know, name that tune. And I'm and, and sure that's <laughs> John Barry Diamonds of Forever, but what location is it? What scene is it? So the music is evocative, and John Barry manages to set this time and place in Las Vegas, mostly the film is set, but without making it campy. The action music is action-y, and the humorous music is humorous, but he manages to, to score it effectively to make the film more than the sum of its parts. With Wint and Kidd, it's one of many late motifs of the film. It's one of many pieces that he gives them. And I can tell you something about this piece for Wint and Kidd. It's two henchmen... Yeah, beautifully said. Let's uh, let's let the music do the talking for itself. Mm, okay. This again from okay. the film Diamonds Are Forever. The cue is called Mr. Wint and Mr. Kid, and it's written by composer John Barry. <laughs> You kind of alluded to it, but maybe we can expand on it a little bit. I'm I'm curious what, because uh, I have my own story. I'd be interested in yours. What was it that, what was it that got you interested in James Bond in those films? Was there something in particular or a combination of things that got you interested in it? I have to swear to you that I'm telling you the truth. But the first film I remember on television in my whole life, and the first film I remember in the theaters with both Bonds. So I'm five years old. 
Grandpa has a very large 26-inch color TV in Whoa. his house. And everybody is gathered around it. Shush, shush, shush. And the first image is a golden hand coming up on the screen, which is Goldfinger. And the projectionist using a female uh, superimposed on the image. And I'm thinking, well, that's got to be a false memory, a Mandela memory, because the opening of Goldfinger is not the title sequence with Shirley Bassey. It's an it's a adventure that happens first. Right, the pre-title sequence, yeah. Except that I realized since then that ABC, when they showed Goldfinger in 1974, deemed the pre-title sequence too violent and began with the titles from the song. So I remember it accurately. That's interesting, because I remember, I watched that telecast as well, but I don't think, I didn't have a, I had seen it in the theaters, but I was like, I was five or six years old, and so I didn't remember everything. I didn't. That's what you just said is interesting. I didn't realize that. They didn't show the pre-title sequence, really. We might have had the same grandfather and been in the same living room at the time. And when I'm eight years old, now I'm giving my age, but my parents had an argument about whether The Spy Who Loved Me would be too risque or whether the double entendres would go over my head, which they did. You can guess which parent was for and which was against. (laughs) But I went in and I really vaguely just remember this cool underwater car, but I'd already seen years before The Godfather and Jaws and all these films on the big screen. The first movie I remember in theaters, Spy Love Me, first movie I remember on TV was Goldfinger. And about a year later at age nine, I was reading Ian Fleming and I was hooked because his writing is is a masterclass in writing and he hooked millions of people. He was more than the J.K. Rowling or Stephen King of his day. He sold tens of millions of novels. So what really kicked it off for me was collecting James Bond books in New York City going to different shops, inquiring, what do you have? And they would say, get out of here, kid. We don't keep that crap here. And <laughs> these same bookstores want those books today. You know that because the first edition of the first Bond novel is, you know, $100,000. Oh, yeah. So collecting since I was a kid books and then later on toys and later on replica props and later on genuine props. But through it all, the soundtrack has been a big part of my life. And much or most of what I listen to musically are film themes and film soundtracks because it, it makes us feel heroic, it makes us feel melancholy, it's beautiful music. Well, and I guess you, my listeners will get tired of me bringing this up, but you and I are, well, I, you look a hell of a lot younger than I am, but maybe we're not, I don't know. But but we remember the day when you couldn't just, you know, plop in a, a disc or a tape into a machine and watch a movie whenever you wanted to. You, you had to hope it was maybe re-released or into theaters, or you just had... To, the only thing you had to rely on to to revisit the film was the soundtrack, wasn't it? A hundred percent, and something that got played until it was worn was our LP of the 13 James Bond themes. Now there's 27 James Bond films. <laughs> and, you know, The Diamonds Are Forever, that was a soundtrack album I owned. And you listen to it incessantly because it, it... A friend said it really well. He said, if I'm on a desert island, I don't want the DVDs. I want John Barry soundtracks with me, and that's all I need. And now I can shell my coconut and milk my coconut, and I'm listening to the film. And I'm hearing it in my head, and I'm imagining it in my head. And the soundtracks make it come alive. Wow. Wow, that's an interesting comment. I, 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 would, I hadn't thought about it, but I, I tend to agree. That's something. Yeah. Wow. That's Do, wow. Doctor, what, what's Dr. Jones without John Williams Cues? What, what's yeah. Christopher Reeve's Superman? You know, and John Barry is a hero to both of us because he's the maestro and he is always perfectly evoking the film and making it more than the sum of its parts. Legendary soundtracks. Yeah, yeah. Oh, good point. Well said, well said. Well, we're going to stick on the James Bond theme, but but kind of divert a little bit in terms of music. I'm going to talk about a, a film called Casino Royale, not the one maybe our lo- younger listeners are familiar with. I'm talking about Casino Royale from 1967. Uh, there's a long story behind that. Maybe you want to share it. You don't have to. If you don't want to, that's fine. But you did choose a cue from there. It's a fabulous score written by Burt Bacharach. Many people, I don't know if you're familiar with this, many people say it's one of the finest recordings that's ever been done. I, I, it was, I guess it was recorded somewhere in Germany or whatever, but it, apparently the, the audio quality is just superior to most everything else certainly at that time period but anyway you chose a cue from that particular film casino royale uh, it's called arrival in berlin written by burt Bacharach. tell us a little bit about 
why you wanted to include that today amongst your favorites. Uh, firstly, because it is one of my favorites. It's one of my three favorite Bond scores. Uh, secondly, because if I went to a film fan and I said, have you heard about the film where James Bond, who's recalcitrant, reluctant, after a long retirement, is pressed forcibly back in a service against his will to rescue his kidnapped daughter from a seaside underground lair <laughs> in which lair the villain is making a deadly virus that can affect hundreds of millions of people Ultimately, the lair is exploded as it needs to be, but both the villain and Bond die. You'd say I was talking about No Time to Die, the 2021 Bond film. I'm also describing part of the plot of the 1967 Casino Royale film. <laughs> there are three dozen other references or three dozen other markers in the film that get echoed in later Eon films. And the film is a brilliant pastiche, and it's filled with puns on Ian Fleming and puns on the Eon Bonds. And I think that you and John Cork, the Corkinator, did a fabulous job on What's the Score of looking at the score exhaustively. But it's such an amazing film to me for different reasons. It was done in cells. What happened was Charles K. Feldman had a runaway hit with What's New Pussycat, again with a great Bacharach score and a great title track sung by Tom Jones. Right. And he had put his screenwriters into cells to develop themes independently, then stitch them together. He had five or six groups working on Casino Royale in 1967, and then they had to come back together and say, well, wait a second. I understand that Evelyn Tremble is going to go to Casino Royale to defeat Le Chief at Baccarat. What in the Sam Hill does that have to do with an abstinent James Bond being unwillingly seduced by dozens of teenage girls while his illegitimate daughter Mata Bond is being <laughs> transported in a UFO from Trafalgar Square to the villain's lair? <laughs> and, and lots of times the film is stitched together with single lines of dialogue. But... The sets are worthy of a Ken Adam who did five Bond films. These magnificent, huge sets. No expense Man. was spared. The costumes were done by Paco Rabanne. You'll never get a cast like that in another Bond film. You have David Niven and people like George Raft and John Paul Belmondo oh, dropping no, in with yeah. Orson Balls, Peter Sellers. And then we go to the music. So Burt Baccarat has a year's notice on this, just like some of the people like Terrence Cooper and Peter Sellers who are on retainer for a year because Feldman was spending all this money. So he has ideas percolating in his head then he builds a soundtrack that's absolutely cunning and brilliant and again has late motifs, different cues. There's even a cue for when David Niven as James Bond is fighting. And there's a cue for this villain and a cue for Berlin. And when you listen to the arrival in Berlin cue, you're going to hear an interlude, which is like Russian gypsy music. Why? Because we're seeing East Berlin, not West Berlin, and East Berlin is bathed in a red light, of course, yeah. and everyone in is red. You know, so hilarious, funny cues. Again, but without going too far into spoof and satire. It's just beautiful, brilliant music. And the main title, Herb Alpert and the Tijuana Brass, even the way they work their instruments is evocative, where the oh. brass comes to the forward, like in a John Barry soundtrack, but then also hangs back, and the trumpet has its own voice, its own, its own concept. Yeah. So music you can listen to on an endless loop almost. You know, I haven't watched that film in years, and... Just because of your enthusiasm for it and your description of it, I need to revisit it. <laughs> I said, that's wonderful how you've described that. Well, let's uh, let's hear it for ourselves. This again is from the 1967 film Casino Royale. The cue is called Arrival in Berlin, and it's written by Burt Bacharach. <laughs> Um, one of the things that you're well known for is this leading uh, fans. I, I don't, and you can tell me, maybe it's not just the Bond films. You might do 
things outside of that uh, realm as well. But you lead fans through, lo- you know, visiting locations. You'll plan a tour where we're going to visit, you know, the Far East or the Caribbean or whatever it may be and, and visit these different var- various Bond locations. I'm kind of curious, is there, it may be unfair to ask for one, uh, but but what are some of your most what are some of your favorite, most spectacular locations that are part of the, the James Bond franchise that you've visited and taken fans on tours of? Well, I love the ones in fun cities, what Ian Fleming called in his book, Thrilling Cities. And you know, Miami's a great example. I've done many tours there. And I always tell people, hey, I'm a Miami Vice fan, Miami Vice head. I've seen every episode, 180 episodes. Let's take it to some Miami Vice locations, too. Let's do some oh, other franchises, yeah. too. Yeah. But what Gene and I are excited about is our Mexico City trip next year, October 2024. We're going to take fans to the Day of the Dead Parade, which is seen by 250,000 Mexico City residents live because the parade was only incepted when they did it faked for the James Bond film Spectre. And then the crew and cast gave some of their costumes and floats and things to the parade. So it's a not-to-be-missed, once-in-a-lifetime event. And Mexico City came up because, coincidentally, Janine and I, many of our favorite locations of all the bonds are in that place. So, for example, we're going to go far out of the way, to the middle of nowhere, to an authentic temple that's used for rituals that became Professor Joe's lair (laughs) and cult center and cocaine processing center in the movie License to Kill. But... It, you're talking about a complex that's made out of concrete and is about a half mile across because the outbound Mexican president, as a gift to the people of Mexico, built this temple, not telling the people that his brother was the leading concrete contractor in Mexico, but you're going to spend hours here because they did 25 different film shoots and scenes here, and you are on a James Bond set. We love the locations. All the fans love locations like uh, Palmyra in the Bahamas sure. or Professor Joe's Complex where you're like, oh my God, I'm in a Bond film. I'm immersed in a Bond set. Uh, and so it's tremendous to be in these places. And I love Star Trek, love Star Wars, but I can't go to Vulcan that often, but hundreds of real world hotels and other venues and restaurants and museums were used for the Bond sets. I uh, I had... A great opportunity. I won't go into the details of how it how it happened, but I actually was able to be on the set of uh, License to Kill uh, for a day when they were filming in the studio. I can't pronounce the name of the studios. They basically rebuilt it. Do you recall what the name was? Was this Tur- Busco in Mexico City? Yeah. 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 I mean, you know, they revitalized that whole place. But anyway, yes. we, we were able to spend a day on the set there and 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 visited some because i got a sheet that said some of the locations that they had and it, well, what a beautiful city it's really nice um i agree with you i mean that's some of the more spectacular locations that you could, you could come up with in the films and and yet you know to be honest they're they're endless i mean phuket in thailand was was phenomenal and amazing mm-hmm. uh something that you wouldn't see normally uh in uh you know, people wouldn't normally think of a location like that until the film came out, and then all of a sudden everybody wanted to go there. So it's, I wonder, I, I wonder what the impact of the Bond films has been for tourism in some of these places, you know? You've, you've caught us out, which is the event next year is an excuse to go to Mexico City. It's a safe city, very inexpensive, magnificent food, not just Mexican cuisine. Oh, although yeah. it's rich regional cuisine, and magnificent sites and museums and a huge travel bargain. And the effect has been phenomenal, so much so that Mexico gave, you know, upwards of about $10 million in tax credits to Eon Productions. And that led to some interesting sidebars on the film, like, oh, the villain can't be Mexican. And he becomes Italian, (laughs) uh, Marco Sierra, in that scene. And again, what's exciting for you and for me, since we're both Bond fans, is how often they reuse a place, but effectively. So you'll be in Mexico City looking at a license to kill location. And as you turn around and face 180 degrees, you're looking at a specter location because they said, hey, this was a great place to work and a great place to visit. Let's come back. Yeah. So it's just rich stuff. And, and lots of times we're on a street where it's both Ian Fleming and the Bond films and so on. It's, it's just much fun. Oh, that great description. Well, let's, um, let's get back to the music. And you chose something I'm not remotely familiar with. I'm ashamed to say, I guess, because I never saw the movie, but I heard a lot about it. And I also didn't realize an unusual composer for some of the music here. The movie I'm talking about is Dune, 
and you wanted to choose the main title from that film, which, if I understand your notes correctly to me, was written by and performed by Toto. Is that correct? <laughs> <laughs> Is that right? Story, yes. Yeah, yeah, no, no. I, yeah. I'm, I'm anxious to. I'm anxious to hear this. It's um. It's one of the more unusual choices from guests that we've had. Which, that, by the way, that's okay. I'd like to hear more about it. So tell me why you wanted to choose that amongst your favorites, because it doesn't sound like it would be uh, in tune with some of the other choices that you made. Right on. I, I mean, I have eclectic tastes, but I wanted to play by the rules. And the rules for me is yeah. it can't just be a great theme, a great main title. It has to be a soundtrack, a whole soundscape that I listen to over and over, whether it's passive and I'm working or I'm listening to it actively. Because to me, a great soundtrack gives you a sense of time and place. And the Dune series of novels by Frank Herbert is phenomenal. And it's world building. It's what's called space opera. It takes place on many planets. It's both dystopian and utopian. It's 10,000 years into the future. But it's man's future. It's not a made up creature, a made up race. It's, it's people and with their human foibles. So, so who do they get for this, this film scoring that David Lynch is doing, who's again also out of the box? Uh, when he brought Dune to the screen after many aborted attempts, right? Uh, Jodorowsky had, had chosen a 10-hour film, the most expensive film in history. He was going to have Salvador Dali in it. He was going to have uh, Mick Jagger starring in it. And eventually David Lynch makes his film, right? With Sting as a bad guy and all this crazy stuff. They get the band Toto. Now, Toto is known for uh, Grammy Award-winning performances and vocal performances and mega hits like uh, Africa track right. and, and Rosanna. But when you listen to Rosanna, the drummer is doing incredibly complex notes overlaid on other notes. It sounds like a machine, and he's playing 40-second notes and all these incredible things that most human drummers can't do. They are musicians of a high caliber. So Dune has odd instruments in the orchestra because they scored the whole film. The main title grabs you, it's instantly recognizable, and it gives you a sense that you are in the future while it's grounded as an 80s piece and you're on this horrible desert planet where this great thing is going to occur, this great arc. And, you know, Hans Zimmer did the new Dune, excited when he did it. He did a brilliant score with lots of interesting, again, innovative pieces. But the original 80s soundtrack, the whole thing is worth a listen because it's, it's a really good mix of what I'm looking for in a soundtrack. There's some melancholy pieces, there's some love themes, but also some real cool heroic action pieces. Very, and, and, and a very David Lynch kind of a choice to have someone like Toto do some of that music. I mean, does that, does that make sense, what, you, what I'm saying? Well, yeah, a, a different way of saying that is this, this is one of those films where some people want to be incredibly high when they go to see the film <laughs> because because it's outlandish and out there, right? And, and that's, not, that's not who I am. That's not what I do. But I, I go to this film again and again, and there's a director's cut out now in the past few years, almost four hours long, because I'm a Dune head, because I read the novels introduced <laughs> to them by this film, and much of the novel's action takes place in the mind of the characters, and he's trying to make that happen with exposition in the film. And if you've loved the Dune books, you are a David Lynch Dune fan. If not, you're like, what just happened? But it was still a seminal film for us in the 80s, and, and it has a cult following. It didn't do super well at the box office. Young people were drawn to it because of what you're saying. The visuals are incredible, and the audio system was incredible. Well, let's, uh, let's have a listen for ourselves. This, again, is the main theme from the film called Dune, and it's written and performed by the group Toto. Let's have a listen.
We'll get back to our program in a minute. This program is done for the love of film and film music, plain and simple. However, it does take a huge investment in time and in fees for me to make the program work for you. I don't sell commercial time and don't really want to on this program. Rather, I'm kind of like a, a public broadcasting station. I need support from listeners like you. For as little as $3 a month, you can help me uh, uh, offset the time spent in putting the program together. Or maybe you just think of it as leaving a tip in the tip jar. Either way, if you can join up, uh, there will be bonuses, like an additional 10 to 15 minute segment with our guest every week. Well, we'll play additional cues as well as ask uh, some extra questions. And it's going to be only available to patrons. How do you sign up? Well, it's simple. You go to patreon.com slash what's the score, and that's all one word. That's patreon, that's p-a-t-r-e-o-n dot com slash what's the score. Check it out. We'd be grateful for your support. That's patreon.com. You've kind of alluded to it, but I, I, perhaps we need to dig a little deeper into it. How is it that you became? How is it that you became a fan of of film music? Because that's now I've mentioned this before with other guests. When I was when I was younger and loved film music, I always felt like an outsider. You know, nobody else around me. You know, they were into I don't know Elton John or the Eagles or Chicago or whatever. But I was into film music, so how was it that you became such a fan of it? What, what was it about it that uh, led you to uh, become such a fan? Another great question, because in middle school and then into high school in New York, I had friends who collected Bond with me. Huh. I said, hey, you got to read this. Let's do this. And they were listening to the film scores with me or on their own, and they were pursuing other film scores because... It's a treasure, and because it's escapism, an escape from humdrum life, and because yeah. it's you know heroism, and 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 it was just it was such a big part of the zeitgeist. People today have all these streaming channels and many different films to choose from, but back then it was: Did you see Indiana Jones? Of course I did. Did you see Star Wars? We all did. Did you see The Simpsons last night? Yes, the entire nation watched <laughs> Simpsons or Mash last night. And then, you know, one day you go, wait a second, that tree in Central Park is in Live and Let Die. That, that cable car that takes me to Roosevelt Island is in the Spider-Man movie. And, and so the music, you know, but it's also this thing that just grabs you by the heart and mind and requires you to put in the blanks with your imagination because in many cases there aren't vocals. So it's not a pop song that does the thinking for you or tells the story for you. You have to listen to the music and decide what it's evoking for you. So it, to me, it's like a puzzle to discern. And, and, and what, are they, what are they thinking about? What's the composer thinking about? So well, I so, find it fascinating. Yeah, so you, you had a, unlike myself, it sounds to me like you had a, a bank of friends or acquaintances that were kind of into the same thing that you were, which I guess would have helped your uh, developing your affinity for it. Yeah, yeah, it, it down to, you know, what's your favorite Bond tune? What's your favorite Ian Fleming novel? Do you have a favorite? And actually, we were Pollyannas. We didn't have favorites. We enjoyed them all. Look at this new cover. The Holy Mackerel. They printed these books in French. Holy Mackerel. There's an LP album of Thunderball, and it's only $2, huh. and it's dusty in the back of the record store. I've never listened to the whole score of Thunderball. Wait a minute. I think there's alternate cues on there that weren't in the film. And again, this is a commonplace discussion in the days of the internet, but back then it was like a new discovery. So it was, it was a puzzle to solve. Now, now, I'm curious, have you ever had, and I'm going to guess you have, but have you ever had a chance to, uh, to, to watch a film before music was put uh, into it? In other words, you, you saw like a, a, a raw cut, or so to speak, of a, of a film with no, no film music, and what, what impact did that have on you? A tremendous impact through connections. I've seen things like 12 Minutes of Goldeneye, 
before it aired in the theaters. And when it's in an early stage, they'll usually just cue music from Dr. No and music from Vic Flick, <laughs> you know, and, and, and to be a part of that process. And so one of the greatest things for me as a fan, doing all these super fan things, and, you know, we've had 100 authors and experts and filmmakers at our events just for Bond Alone, getting to briefly work with people like Vic Flick and John Barry and David Arnold to get some insights. And the other thing is that when... We, there's one tour that we did in the Bahamas in 2006. We're looking at Casino Royale locations from the Daniel Craig film. The film hadn't come out yet. So mostly it was people going, what is this construction site, Matt? And I'm like, just take photos. You'll thank me later because I hate movie, <laughs> movie spoilers. I hate movie spoilers. But when you watch these Bond films without the audio track, it's, a, it's just a different realm, a different world. Where's the timing coming from? For humorous cues, like in Casino Royale, they'll have a doot 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 going along with a pun moment. You know, they, you know the, 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 there's a delicious understanding of, for example, Bond, one of my favorites, that is the music going to indicate something? In other words, one of the reasons that people are really drawn to the Daniel Craig films, these newer films, is because it's how it should be, according to me as a Fleming reader. It should be jarring, sudden violence that jolts you and they go, oh my gosh. Rather than a musical cue, like we're going to play the villain's music and you see the villain get in his car and then you see the car going down the road, there's more villainous music and then he launches the bomb. It should be a sudden surprise thing. So it's the restraint in soundtracks that intrigues me. Where is it silent? Where is it quiet? Where is it... And, and, and another look at this question, because it's a brilliant question you've asked, Frank, it really is. Note what they've done in the recent remastering of many films, not just the Bonds, where they go to 4K or they go to Blu-ray. Often they take liberties not only with the color palette and cleaning that up, with the sound score. And so you get John mm -hmm. Barry cues that were never meant to be that loud and cover the dialogue, or yep. never meant to be that quiet. And they play with the explosions and the gunshots. It's a different interpretation than the director gave us. So the You're actors. right. You're right. Yeah, uh, Majesties was a, a classic example of that, where they change the sound mix on that a lot oh yes and i can tell you and tell your listeners if they promise not to spread the spread the story around <laughs> uh john barry was personally incensed that moonraker was basically recorded in mono oh yeah oh no that's not a secret in fact <laughs> uh, uh, I, I don't know perhaps, if that came across yeah perhaps you haven't heard it but i but i i uh one of my episodes I uh, I was very very fortunate to have a, a a brief phone interview with John Barry back in the early 1980s, and uh, and we talked about that, and yeah he was he was, let's just let's just say what it was he was pissed, and he even even commented I, I think he even says in the interview I, I I mentioned it to the Hollywood Reporter that I couldn't believe these idiots what did they why did they you know put the music in mono when we had Dolby Stereo available so. And when he saw the film for the first time, he was just he was just floored. So yeah, that's, that's yeah that's yeah. Florida's secret. putting it mildly, and I'm glad that you had that wonderful experience. And what's the score has done tremendous work on the bonds lately, and appreciate you having me on as another bond guest. Yeah. But yeah, what were they thinking? I, I mean, Star Wars had just come out. What was the thought process? Uh, <laughs> melancholy music and grand space opera music, and then it's reduced, and it's fabulous, fabulous score. Yeah. Well, let's uh, let's have a listen to another. Uh, Q or Q's actually, I'm going to play them back to bath that, that you liked from a, a, another James Bond film. We're talking about the film Live and Let Die. And this was the first time that uh, John Barry wasn't available. He was working on a, a, a West End play, that he a musical that he had done called Billy and just wasn't available to score this. And word has it that he had recommended George Martin to write the score. I don't know whether or not that's true or not, but for a lot of Bond fans, I know that uh, people loved it, the work that he did on this. And you chose a couple of uh, cues from this, uh, one called uh, New Orleans, simply, and the other one called Fight at the Airport. Tell us a little bit about why you wanted to include those today for to play for our listeners. Well, thank you so much. They're brief cues, but they're concurrent. There's only a bit of dialogue in, interspersed between them. And they're evocative because, again, these three Bonds, Casino Royale, Diamonds of Forever, Living That Die, their favorites. I could have picked any track from them and, and loved it and known it note for note. And, yeah. But it's evocative of the action because the film has voodoo and the film has uh, a heroine solitaire played by Jane Seymour. She has psychic powers and they accept it for granted in the film just like they did in the book, which is an interesting thing in itself. 
and there's there's danger, real suspense and action. And so this, this soundtrack doesn't let up. It's just relentless. Now, something fascinating about it to me is that when you listen to it with the visuals, it's evocative a little bit of its time, and you almost feel like you're watching a 1970s, 1980s cop show on television. <laughs> almost like a little obvious, like, da, da, that means that something big's going to happen. Yeah. And, but when you listen to the score without being distracted by the visuals, and it is one of my favorite James Bond films, it's a powerful score, again, with these wonderful motifs for the villain and Bond and the heroine and these recurring themes that build on one another. So in these two cues, you're going to hear the build up to the explosion, if you will, and then the explosion. And it's all right there. And it's it's up there. And he's definitely captured George Martin has captured uh, John Barry's style. Yeah. Yeah. And, and you bring up a good point, too, that sometimes sometimes scores work great for the film, but they're not necessarily a enjoyable uh, listening experience just on their own <laughs> and yet uh, you, you know what I'm saying I do and, I do. and, and, and a lot of Barry stuff and, and, and I, I would also include George Martin's score for this one that as a standalone they're an enjoyable listening experience as well as in the film themselves as a standalone they take you to a new place or a new height or they're good for having a scotch or a cigar or a good cry and they are standalone wonders. And John Barry, I don't know if you had discussed this with him, was astonished at one point that people listen to this. He, <laughs> he, said, he said to friends, like, who buys Thunderball and Goldfinger? Who listens to it? Not realizing we're listening to it daily for months at a time. Oh, yeah. That, yeah. you know, John, John was invited to several of our fan events. And the invite went something like this from Vic Flick. John, you got to go. You're like a god to these people. It's more important that you go than Sean Connery go. Because the average Bond devotee is almost more interested in the soundtrack than the actors. It's that important now, to us. You, you're, you're, you're spot on. And, and you're right. I mean, I, I, I don't think he had... He didn't have a clue. I, seriously. He did not have a clue how much he meant to people and, and, and his work and what he had, and what he had produced. He, he truly, he did... He was, and I think it was genuine. He was absolutely flabbergasted by the fact. You, you, really, I mean, you like it that much? I mean, you, yeah, right, yeah, we do. <laughs> well, right, you know, you're, you're a celebrity, which he was in persona, and he's dating famous people, and he's living that life. But he's not getting these fan letters. Maybe he's more reclusive or more unavailable as an address. But he's not getting these letters. I was going to kill myself. But then I sat there and I listened to, you know, the black hole 20 times. And I said, life has meaning or whatever it is. And, and, and it, you know, his music is his music touches raw emotion. You can't put it into words. He's just yeah. in touch. Yeah. Well, let, let's go back to the cues you talked about. Then we'll uh, play these. This again from the film uh, Live and Let Die. Uh, the two cues are called New Orleans and Fight at the Airport. And they're written by composer George Martin. <laughs> Are you a musician by any chance? Do you read music or play an instrument? I sing and in, uh, and I teach vocal music. I coach vocalists and I've coached choirs and individuals to sing and I've done singing and performance on stage. Oh, okay. So, 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 so you do have life. a musical background. Yeah, music, music is life. And in my formative years, being part of a really, really amazing high school choir with a fabulous you know, leader was, was very helpful. 
and and it 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 got me through a lot of tough times and music is always a touchstone yeah yeah i bet i bet and, and, and then to switch gears one of the things that i was interested in asking you about because i was uh, uh i know some people said uh i'm talking about this this documentary that aired on vice and I and I know that you know some of the old guard, the the the, the longtime Bond fans. Oh, nothing new here, nothing new here. Hey, look, I actually I learned a few new things, and plus the fact, I just I I, I thoroughly enjoyed it. And so I'm kind of wondering, what was that experience like being a part of that documentary? I am sitting in the James Bond room in my home. It is where we had a crew, and they said we'll do a 90 minute interview, and they sat here for five hours, and I have to tell you, best interview questions from a documentary crew ever. Things like Matt, the third Five assistant. Hours? The third assistant director on Doctor No was so and so. How did he affect the film? And I learned things watching that documentary. And I have read more than one book about the books and more than one book about the films. And yeah. John Cork is saying spectacular things. And you have a who's who of people like Matthew Field and AJ Chowdhury on there giving right. vent. And it was not your grandfather's documentary, and I found it riveting. And I'm going to watch it again because Janine saw some of it, and she wants to see the whole thing. And it was very well done. And I have a personal stake there too. I, I brought some of the talent to the documentary. Hey, these actors would be great. These friends would be great for interviews. Their questions are beautiful. So Vice TV, it's out in a variety of outlets like Philo and Fubo TV. Uh, very, very insightful. And yeah, they were here for hours, held over because we had stories to tell. We wanted them to live. Five hours? Well, that was just the interview. They also had to spend another couple of hours setting up the lighting and filming Holy my collectibles. Smokes. That was a lot of fun. It was a day I wish I could have again. It was a, it was a lot of fun. Oh, and, and and the thing about the documentary is they don't uh, they don't elucidate in the documentary. They don't talk about it. What they were focusing on was changes in Bond. So Connery's first film and Connery's return and Timothy Dalton's entry and Pierce Brosnan's entry and the transition and passing the baton. And so they were looking for when the world changed and when Bond changed with it. And they also had great material on Ian Fleming, which is a rare bird. As a book fan, it drives me nuts. Oh, it's the 60th anniversary of Bond. No, it's not. 2022 is 70th anniversary of Bond. Yeah, yeah th that kind of thing. It's not the movies. It's he, without the books, there'd be no movies, dude. Yeah. You know? But the documentary did a great job. And the other thing that, you're, that your listeners may not know yet is because it was under an umbrella that included, say, Amazon, and Amazon now has distribution rights. Right. Uh, normally, if I do a newspaper or a, a TV interview and they want to use certain things, they can't do it because royalties are expensive. They had unlimited use to the Bond clips because Amazon owns them now in some ways. Oh, okay. So it would be me talking and saying, yes, it is. And Sean Connery going, Matt is right, which I also found wonderful. <laughs> <laughs> you know, and uh, James Bond's echoing me. And, and, and I was, I've never been that thrilled to see myself on an appearance before because I'm like, I'm talking about my love for Fleming and there he is on the screen. And it was wonderful. Oh, that's great. That's that's nice to hear. Sometimes you people's experiences on something like that isn't all that terrific. But uh, and not only you, I've talked to a couple of other people who are part of it as well have had mm. positive things to say about it. So I'm I'm glad it worked out well. And I and Indeed. I loved it. And your contribution to it was uh, obviously very important. Um, Thank you. The. The other cue you chose is is one that I'm a big fan of, and to me, John Barry was robbed of at least Oscar nominations on two films in this time period, one being Somewhere in Time, and the other one being a, a film that you chose, uh, that being Body Heat, and you wanted to play the main titles for that. Now, you may be aware of the fact that we actually talked to the, uh, on a recent episode, we talked to the saxophonist that was featured on that uh, on that score and whatnot, so he had some interesting things to say about it. But I'd be interested in hearing your your uh, your viewpoint out of everything. This is you could this have is Ronnie Lang. Today, what, I'm sorry. Was it Ronnie Lang? The, yeah, uh, alto sex. So I had no idea because I listened to some, but not all of what's the score. I'd love to hear that because I was going to opine on his saxophone playing in body. Well, and and, pl and please do it. it but it is. As we're recording this today, I don't know when you people are going to be listening to this, but as we were recording today, he's the the previous episode. It, it's up right now. It, it's only been up for like a week or so. Oh, that's how I and, missed it. And I got to tell you, you know, he's a John Barry standby. 
Oh, and you yeah. have to under, and the thing, the reason why somewhere in time and body heat plays right into his wheelhouse is if you think about it, in a sense, if I can be so bold, John Barry would compose about an hour of score for a two-hour film and then play it laconically or leisurely. In other words, somewhere in time, you feel like it should go ba da 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 and it's going ba da 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 it, it's, it's every note held out to the infinite length. Huh. It makes it more melancholy. It drives the emotions more. So Body Heat is playing into his wheelhouse because it's a neo-noir classic. It started a neo-noir trend. Fabulous cast, right? Kathleen Turner, William Hurt, Ned Beatty, oh, yeah. all these great, right? And I also love locations, and I'm very familiar with the Palm Beach and Fort Lauderdale locations here in Florida from Body Heat and, and grew up visiting some of them, coincidentally. And why is it such a great score? Many reasons. And for fans interested, you know, we have Screen Archive has a double CD out now of Body Heat Remastered. It's amazing. Including 10 demos, right? 10 demos of the main theme. It is amazing. Here's the thing about the saxophone, okay? In the main theme, you're going to hear the saxophone lead. And how can you possibly have an 80s song without a saxophone? What would Huey Lewis in the news be or Madonna be without a saxophone? Right, that's 1980s. Bill Clinton becomes president of the United States, apparently on his saxophone skills. Or, <laughs> you know, no matter how good a saxophonist or not he is, it's in our zeitgeist. It's a sax. And then you can just see, as you listen to it, John Barry telling Ronnie, take it easy. Take it easy, mate. Too much vibrato. Lean back. Hold those notes. Don't embellish. Don't come to the fore. Hold back. It's latent energy. It's potential energy because it's a smoky, sensual, slow burn noir film. In other words, when you listen to the main theme, it's just going on forever and the notes are just being held sweetly on the saxophone. They're not blasted and they're just lovely. It's you're, just you're, a lovely you're, piece. You're spot on, and I want to encourage you. Please listen to the episode with Ronnie, because of course, because he uh, he talks about that working relationship with him, and I and I think it's kind of interesting. Without you having heard that interview, I think you are gonna you'll end up finding out huh, that's exactly what happened. <laughs> so, well, you know, we, we we've been lucky. You and I've been fortunate to talk with people like John and and other great musicians in this in Reno. So, but yeah. Well, let's uh, let's have a listen. This, again, this is an iconic theme in, in film score. Again, to me, largely, uh, unfortunately, unrecognized for its brilliance. But uh, mm. let's pay it its due right now. Uh, we're going to play the uh, main theme from the film called Body Heat, and it's written by composer John Barry. Thank you. 
So Matt, I mean, you have a lot of things on your uh, on your plate. Uh, I know you have a you have a regular career, for lack of a better way of saying it, but you have this <laughs> passion that you do uh, lots of things connected with the films and things like that. But I am curious for our listeners, how is it that they can kind of tune into you and find out more about what you're doing and what you're offering out there for people who are fans, not only of Bond films, but of, uh, of just uh, film and TV in general? Oh, I love discussing these things with the fans, and, and frankly, they can have my email, bacon, like eggs and bacon, bond like James Bond, bacon bond at Gmail. Send me a line. Let's talk soundtracks. Let's talk film music. And bondfanevents.com is my website. Bond Fan Events has a listing of things we're doing until like 2025, and there's more to come. I'm in development right now on some new exciting projects, including a revisit to London, because our London... Uh, let's spec it out and see how this trip will work. That trip worked really well this summer, and we want to do an event in London soon as well. So Mexico, London, Italy, and events in the United States upcoming. And we welcome fans. If you're a fan, you're one of us, you belong. We'd love to hear from you. Yeah, I couldn't agree more. You'll want to do this for a couple of reasons. One, certainly the locations are... It's really special to be able to visit the location. And a lot of times, let's face it, they don't look the same as they did. You know time takes its toll on it or maybe it's been remodeled or whatnot but still it's it's really interesting to visit the locations but i think also in addition to that and perhaps even more importantly is the connection you make with other people that feel the same way that you do uh, other fans and i think that's one of the things i mentioned when i when i met you and uh, with the group that you had on that tour i mean it, it it's special to be able to talk with people that share your same passion and find out, uh, maybe I'm alone in this, but I, uh, again, I just never, I, I don't come across a lot of people that have the same level of passion for it that I do. And, and when you have that opportunity to meet those people on a on a tour like what you're organizing, it's really special and, uh, and a great opportunity. So, yeah, I would encourage people to visit your website and, and take part in these tours if you have a chance to do so. You, you hit the nail on the head, if I may. I just started something on Facebook called What's the Scene? <laughs> or guess, rather guess the scene, meaning don't just post a location photo, let us have a guess, or let us help you as experts find a location. And that's why What's the Score is there, to link out with these passionate people. You joined us on Friday night, you shared it was wonderful. On Thursday night, when the early arrivals gathered, in the same spot, by the way, in New Orleans, I was really moved. This had never really happened before. Everyone became Mr. and Mrs. Huggy. It wasn't just me, but everyone was hugging. And a couple of people, this was their first James Bond event with us, their eyes got big as saucers, and they're like, wow, will I fit in here? And of course they did. And the last day of that event, people were in tears. I mean, not... I bet. Baby, not, not crocodile tears. They were weeping openly. They're like, I feel loved, I feel cherished, I have friends, I have someone to lean on, because the tour became very quickly, what's going on with you? What's going on with your life? How can we uh, help you or, or mend the fence? And it was just wonderful. So people all year long have no one to talk to about music and film and books. And then they get that one week a year or that one week in a year to let loose and to be accepted. And there's no internet trolls at our event. And we don't care if you like Roger Moore better than Sean Connery, better than Timothy Dalton or hate them all. We don't care. You're a fan and you're... Instead of going to visit Grandma this Christmas, you're flying to the Bahamas to... Now, admittedly, the weather is much nicer in the Bahamas, but we appreciate you. Yeah, well, and it, and it's you're right, and, and and these friendships end up. My experience has been, at least, and I'm sure that you probably concur with this, that the friendship starts with this affinity for James Bond and everything related to it, but then eventually it goes beyond that. And it's tell me about your family. Oh, you know, how's your wife doing? You know, has she had that challenge? You know, it becomes much more than just a friendship only based on James Bond, it, it goes beyond that. And that's one of the special things about it, I think. A hundred percent and a hundred percent through the year, this constant notes, joys and sorrows. Matt, can you pray for me? You're a praying kind of guy. Matt, I have this issue. Can you help me? And that, that brought a lot of the wealth of knowledge and even collectibles to me because I've had many people, dozens of people go, can you help me? I have a burden to get my James Bond art to the world or my new book out there. How can help me? Of course we want to help you. You're a fan. Of course. Yeah. It's been Nicely exciting. Put. Nicely put. Well, Matt, I, I can't tell you. I've, I have thoroughly enjoyed our conversation. I hope you've enjoyed it as much as I have. 
I certainly have, and you've done a lot of Bond content recently, so maybe not so soon, but you and I should jump in and do a retrospective of all 27 Bond soundtracks. Hey, that's that's Uh, an idea. That's an idea. I'm going to keep that in the back of my mind. Uh, Again, my my thanks to you, Matt, for taking the time to be with us today and sharing some of your favorites. Uh, I also want to thank all our patrons who support the program through Patreon.com, as well as all our listeners for that matter. Uh, Thanks again for listening, and then supporting the program in your own way and uh, I guess with that there's only one thing left for me to say and that's simply this that my name's Frank R. Wilson my time's up I thank you for yours thanks for listening to What's the Score <laughs>